Hello and welcome to the Made Cast, the official podcast of the Museum of Art and Digital Entertainment, a series of lectures on video game history as part of the Made's ongoing effort to preserve history through teaching and displaying playable exhibits of rare games and consoles. While life in the time of COVID has forced us to close our doors, the support of people like you has allowed us to continue to bring history to you through lectures like the one you'll hear in a few minutes. I'm Anthony. I'm Red. I'm Chin. And I'm Miles. This week, our guest is Tony Barnes, head of Retro Ninja Games and a veteran game dev for over 30 years. This is a uh, pretty interesting talk. I really enjoyed it. Uh, yes, but first, same. we're going to get into a bit of news. Uh, keeping in line with basically all video games ever nowadays that have any sort of following, uh, Legend of Mana is getting an anime adaptation. Uh, Warner Brothers and Square Enix are working together on that. And we don't know too much about it yet, but it should be interesting at least. Finger cross. Uh, yes, I'm also interested to see how Warner Brothers is going to handle an anime adaptation. But that's just they they have I'm sure they have enough money to hire great artists. So we'll, I don't we'll know. see. I feel like I've started having nightmares. Well, oh, um, don't worry. The nightmares will come. The nightmares. The nightmares will come. That's the secret of mana. It's the nightmares. <laughs> Get it? Because that's the that's the other game. Mm-hmm. That uh, the other one with mana. The other one. In other news, we're getting new Mii fighters for Super Smash Bros. Along with the release of Kazuya from Tekken, uh, we're getting Ooh. Dante from Devil May Cry. We're getting Shantae from the Shantae series. <laughs> Shantae. <laughs> uh, I'm excited about that actually. We're getting Lloyd from Tales of Symphonia, and in keeping with Todd Howard's uh, bid to rule the world, we're getting Skyrim's Dovahkiin. Well, okay. As long as you can, as long as there's gonna be a shout, you can do, or just throw your, throw the ancient helm at somebody, <laughs> then I'll be happy. The actually, I shouldn't be though. I shouldn't be. Todd Howard's bid to rule the world is. Listen, he's doing it. He's winning. He's <sighs> he is. He's winning, and it started with Xbox. He was like, "Oh, so you." Oh, so now, as a PS5 fanboy, I'm not going to probably get Elder Scrolls Six for a year after its release. <laughs> it would be great if they add music, too. Like the very classic one. Ooh. That would be cr- that would be pretty great. Honestly, if the one bid that I need Todd Howard to do is... The Mii Fighter shouldn't have been Dovahkiin. It should have been dog meat. And that's, that's all I need to say about that. <laughs> should have been dog meat. Which uh, in is other news. R.I.P. River, uh, the dog that was actually the model for dog meat in Fallout Four, recently passed away a month ago. So, or a couple weeks ago, rather. But rest in peace, River the dog. You will be missed. Dog meat was you a good will live dog. forever in the game as a, a name dog meat. <laughs> but I think it's about time we throw it on to Tony Barnes. Uh, the news for oh. Sp- well, I'll talk about Smash later. Just started playing a Switch. Uh, picked it up before I had a little break. So I am looking forward to using all of these Smash Bros. characters. But we need to throw it over to Tony Barnes to hear him talk about uh, his start in the industry and what he's doing now, uh, as well as his game Run, Die, Run. Uh, Run, Die, Run again. It, you'll hear a lot about it. Without further ado, here's Tony Barnes. And we are back here with Tony Barnes. Tony, welcome. Hi. How are you doing? Uh, Tony, I, I just, I don't know where to begin in your illustrious career. You've done so many wonderful games that I've enjoyed from uh, the Strike series, Urban Strike, Jungle Strike, and the Buffy the Vampire Slayer series to, you know, uh, all sorts of things like your crew ball. Uh, why don't you take us back to how you got started with programming? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I actually wanted to be like a, well, first I wanted to do comic books and was, you know, drawing and all that fun stuff. And then I wanted to be an animator. So um, I was in a class, my, my school, it was interesting because um, we had a lot of uh, people who left that school or their kids went to that school and they were actually working for places like uh, ILM and whatnot around. So I was kind of surrounded by media in general. And um and our school got Apple II computers, uh, you know, donated because uh, we also had, you know, Apple connections. And it um, nobody knew what to do with them. 
like uh, the the teachers were just like um i don't know play organ trail and here's some math stuff if anybody knows how to use this have fun so i raised my hand and said oh i know how to use it which i didn't but <laughs> You know, as, uh, as as the mantra for for today's age is "fake it till you make it." Um, I I just you know I just wanted time on the computer and whatnot, and just felt really drawn to it. So that was like uh, when I was like 11 or 12, and I um, I found it easier to move pixels to to actually figure out how to program and to move pixels than it was to sit there and do stop motion or hand drawn animation. So that's kind of the the start of it was just making, you know, Pac-Man and Space Invaders basically in in 6th grade for me. Where did you get that that programming knowledge from from the books, the sort of procedural how-to basic books? Uh that came shortly after. Yes. Um so there was a kid uh he was an 8th grader. So he was like, you know, ooh, this old guy to me. <laughs> and um he had made some simple maze game and I have no idea where he learned what he learned, but, um, he, he, uh, I, I was amazed by his maze game and he, uh, pushed the break key, which, uh, most people don't even know what the hell that is. <laughs> and he pressed the break key and then he typed list, which, and again, nobody knows what the hell that is, <laughs> but, um, and all of these words just flew by on the screen. And he said, that's what makes it go. Have fun. <laughs> that's and, and so I just sat there and I started, you know, he said, uh, these things right here are, are variables. And these are words that the computer understands to make things go. Have fun. So um, I fiddled around with some variables, see what made things tick and made things change and broke stuff. Um, and then um, just kind of grokked my way through his his pac-man maze game uh that way and then um probably i don't know a few months later or so i um my my mother was like oh you know you're into the computers so the computers because you know that's how, yeah. how they talk um and, and she wanted to make sure that i wasn't getting into into anything any trouble or whatever during the summer so she sent me to summer school and sent me um uh to a uh computer class and um you know we were like super dirt poor so i i think everyone that helped her helped me to get me into that class um what was funny was by the time i got to that class um, it was a beginning basic class by that time i was far more like an intermediate basic but um and the the class um uh was at lowell high school yay go lowell and um <laughs> And uh, they had Ataris, so uh, I had exposure to this machine that seemed just amazing compared to the Apple, because the Apple was great and all that high res, but you know it didn't have colors, and um, and the uh, the guys at, in the class um, who were um, in the intermediate class next to me, um, they had a bunch of games, wares, as the kids call them. Yeah. <laughs> was this the 8-bit Atari or the 16-bit Atari? No, this is the 8-bit Atari. Okay, we're, yeah. still, we're still in the 80s. Yeah. I mean, so, you know, a lot of people will say, like, you know, how long they've been in the business and, and um, or, or they'll, they'll use the words, I've been... Um, making games or somehow associated with games for X amount of time. I don't count when I was 12 um, because even though I was making games, I wasn't in the business. I, I, I got into the business in 85 by actually making things that I sold. And that's kind of where that, that came from was um, talking to these kids in the intermediate classes and stuff. And they started telling me, teaching me techniques and things. And they were very uh, Atari focused because, you know, they had the Atari. And so I would actually, again, you know, I, I mentioned I was poor and all that fun stuff. Um, I would actually write in class um, code on a notebook paper, you know, and I had like a, a notebook and I still to this day write down all kinds of stuff on a, a notepad. Um, but I would mm -hmm. write out my programs um, on uh, on notebook paper, and then I would, uh, you know, take it to a friend's house or somebody that had an Atari, and I'd type it in, 
and then mm-hmm. de- debug from there and then eventually like save up for a floppy disk because a five and a uh, five and a quarter back then it cost you like 10 bucks i think which is uh, probably what What's that the equivalent of now nowadays? Like like forty bucks or something ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. well, and, certainly a double sided bit. Yeah. Oh oh well, no, I had a hole punch. The, that was the old school way of making something <laughs> double sided. Yeah. But yeah, you know, I, I, I saved up for a disc so I could actually, um, you know, take the program that I was making away from <laughs> my friend's computer. Mm-hmm. Um, and eventually, I made a game that way and uh, sold it to um, Antic. Mm-hmm. I. I, I which is I, I loved Antic magazine, um, and that was in the Bay Area in San Francisco. You know, I was born and raised, um, so it was easier to go to them than Compute. Which you were asking about books, and Compute is uh, all, uh, the Compute's book of Atari, uh, Compute's book of Atari Volume Three, mm-hmm. Compute's book of Graphics. All of those books, which I still have some of them, those are uh, those those were like my foundation for. Um, and, and compute and antic magazine were also my foundations on, you know, how how to make games essentially. Because mm-hmm. like I said, the guy just kind of, you know, the the first guy with the apple just threw me at it, and then I was kind of in this weird place with the summer camp. And when I got a hold of the books, you know, I just went through them and um, and learned, you know, how to how to move something across the screen and how to detect whether it hit something and make a score and all that fun stuff. So how did you go from Antic to the more established companies? I mean, some of these companies you've worked at in your career, you've gone back to them multiple times. Like you've, <laughs> some of the big boys. I mean, you built quite a career out of this. Um, yeah. So I, you know, Antic, like I said, I grew up with Antic and um, like I was sitting there and, and, and their submissions started, you know, becoming not as cool you know jd casing wasn't throwing stuff out every five seconds um that's a guy who made a lot of really great stuff for the guitar and um and i knew they were in the city um so i i made a disc and uh that had three games and i um i literally walked it into their to their offices mm-hmm. and handed it to them and um, I know that the receptionist, she was just completely confused. Like, <laughs> what is this? Who is this kid? Um, and he's handing me this disc. And I didn't think anything would happen uh, or come of it. But a few months later, I got um, a letter that said, love your stuff, love everything about you, uh, sign away all your rights, and we'll, and we'll cut you a check. <laughs> um, so I did. And here I am, this, you know, this 14 year old kid. Um, and I got a so for one of the games, uh, which was called Dynamite Dan, which they renamed and kind of remixed into this thing called Escape from Hell. Um, <laughs> they cut me a check for uh, um, 2500 bucks. That's in 1984. So um, or no, 1985, sorry, late 85, actually. Wow. So, um, you know, poor kid, uh, late 85, 2500 bucks. Um, no, no bank account because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, um, so my mother was like, what is this? And I said, <laughs> you know, all, you know, those games she's told me to stop playing. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, this is from one of them. I made the game and she asked how long it took me to make the game. How long was I working on it? And I said, you know, uh, about eight hours over a couple of days. And um, so then at that point, she said, uh, OK, um, you can you can probably play with your, with your video games a little more. Fast forward, um, you know, Atari, Antic, Amiga, all these things and, you know, the rise and fall of various systems. So I, um, I, I figured I'd make a career out of it. I felt like, you know, making games was something that I was good at and was kind of doing. And um, so I just, I, 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 I don't know, I just kind of made connections because one of the things is when you work for a place, um, it makes it easier to say, hi, I'm Tony Barnes from Antic Publishing. And then all of a sudden, you know, someone goes, oh, hey, you know, 
or Tony Barnes instead of going Tony who what because they hear the Yantic publishing. Mm -hmm. um, so that helps open doors with connecting with people. Um, and I actually, uh, by the time Antic kind of went down, um, I was, you know, I had gone through puberty and all this fun stuff, and I looked older than I was. Mm -hmm. So I could go into bars, and I would always, <laughs> and, you know, uh, so after work, I would go into bar, into this one bar, and it was kind of a very, it was a very 80s, late 80s, goth, cyberpunky kind of bar. And I, um, I was sitting there and I had my discs because by that time we were doing uh, Mega stuff, and I had some uh, a bunch of three, uh, three and a half, and um, there was a guy with a um, dog. Uh, he had a chain, a bike chain for a dog for a, 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 a collar around his neck, mm -hmm. and he was wearing like you know leather. He was very like you know Mad Max looking. Um, had a mohawk. And he asks me, you know, what are, uh, what are those for? I'm thinking, oh, okay, here we go. Okay, whatever. Um, you know, oh, I make games. And he's all, you make games? Oh, so do I. <laughs> <laughs> I go, like, what? And, and, and my brain is thinking, yeah, right. And um, he whips out his badge, and, it, and it's his, his badge uh, from Epix, uh, you know, the... Uh, oh, Epix, yeah. Yeah, the, and it was uh, this guy, Matt Crysdale. And uh, so he was uh, the artist, because, you know, back then they just had artists, not necessarily lead. But um, he was the artist on um, Summer Games and a couple of other Lynx games he was working on. Sure, sure. And um, he said, oh, you got to meet my friend. Uh, you got to meet my friend, uh, Greg Thomas. And uh, you and him will get along because you both like prints, because obviously Matt and I had talked, but I'm trying to you know, shorten this up. But um, <laughs> uh, so I talked to his friend, Greg, and yes, we both like Prince and we got along and all this fun stuff. And um, Greg, Greg Thomas, Matt Christale and Scott Patterson um, mm -hmm. had this little company called Visual Concepts mm -hmm. and uh, Visual Concepts. They were doing Apple 2GS stuff and they wanted to port to the Amiga. And they were also getting in um, with um, Britannica Software um, who were doing edutainment. And um, so we were all kind of friends and kind of working together. And um, fast forward, you're asking like like big guys, like say Electronic Arts, fast forward um, a couple of years and um, Greg gives me a call and says, hey, EA is looking for someone who's like a designer with some coding background and, um, you know, maybe can kind of, you know, Jack of all trades kind of guy, you know, mm -hmm. do you know someone like that? And I'm all, oh, I don't know. Do I know someone like that? Yeah, Cause <laughs> yeah. when you, you know, when you're a kid in the eighties, uh, growing up in the Bay area and actually even probably not even the Bay area wasn't, you know, but it's like when you're a kid in the eighties, there's a handful of companies that if, if you're thinking I want to make games and who am I going to do it with? Mm -hmm. Um, and it's you know Electronic Arts, Lucas Arts, and um, and uh, like Sierra. Urban Sign yeah. Apps. Well, because I was in the Bay Area, you know, I was yeah, thinking yeah. about like uh, places I could actually you know walk to or ride the bus <laughs> to. Um, so the opportunity to go to Electronic Arts um, was like, are you kidding? Yeah, dude. <laughs> okay. Um, so. Uh, uh, Greg made the connection there, the love connection, um, because he was working with them on a few things. And we kind of made a pact, which actually we stuck to for a little while, that we would work on each other's games. We would always work on each other's games. Oh. So we actually, like, um, you know, Visual Concepts did the port of Desert Strike to the Super Nintendo. Um, and I worked on, like, you know, um, Madden and college football and... Um, and like, you know, a little bit on Claymates and, and Harley's Humongous Adventure and Clay Fighter because we were kind of going back and forth working on each other's stuff. Yeah, and the, 60, the, the Genesis looked almost like the systems you had already been programming, right? Oh, yeah, the Genesis was, I mean, like, yeah, if you, if you track, mo certain people will have this progression and it makes sense now um, where it goes Atari to Amiga to Genesis, like... Mm -hmm. 
that that progression for a lot of people i think makes a lot of sense those machines even though you know you you switched brands they had the same kind of feel and um when you got in there with the 68000 you know they had they they spoke to you the same kind of language and um and so yeah like that was that was definitely my progression so on to your current day what are you up to now uh now well let's see so after after doing this for um this is year 36 i think it is or something like that um uh the, uh i what was it last year it's getting fuzzy now but you know right before COVID, um i um was like you know kind of made a lot of money and a lot of things for other people and i should probably be on my third company by now Maybe this is the right time and, you know, no slight on Amazon, but the kind of things that we were doing there and that they wanted me to do there weren't really the things that were exciting me. And I really was like, you know, I kind of want to get back to my roots. Um, and so I looked at like all of the everything lining up, you know, distribution and tools and all of these things and said, OK, that's it it's now or never or whatever. So I uh, quit and started my own company and it's called Retro Ninja. And um, it's, uh, I, I had a tagline, but I haven't really used it a whole <laughs> lot. It's like, uh, you know, um, old, uh, was it old school cooking with new school flavor or something like that. I, I, mm -hmm. But basically um, doing the kind of games that I'm known for um, and that kind of have fallen by the wayside i mean like lots of people are doing retro stuff um but n no offense to them they're decoding the kind of things that i did already so they don't they don't have the dna to draw from and sure. um and so i'll play someone's game and i'll be like this is great this person gets it or i'll play something and i'll be like oh this is great but i can tell they they don't understand why we made those decisions back then and oh, therefore yeah. they either continued bad practices or didn't do something mm -hmm. now, yeah so, the, there's games where like the uh, enemies will drop off the screen when you scroll back just like the old days where they wouldn't be in the frame buffer anymore and it's like that was that was a problem please don't right. rep replicate that kind of stuff right <laughs> Yeah, I mean, when I was working on, uh, and, and this is also part of uh, going going uh, solo or independent or whatever, is um, when I was working on uh, Strider, which was a um, a uh, bucket list item for me, actually. Like, you mm -hmm. know, back in the day, there were a handful of games. I was like, oh, my God, if I could ever make games for a living, I would do this. And it would be like, you know, Strider or Bruce Lee or R-Type. But, um, you know, when I was working on uh, Strider 2014, um, there's a lot that's in that that is old school, but not really. It's old school the way you remember it, not necessarily the way it was. And it has a lot of things that um, are are quite modern that um, make some old school purists bristle. But it, what it does is it, it makes um, people who want that nostalgia uh, you know, it, it makes it accessible to them and to a new generation. And that's kind of what Retro Ninja is about. It's like making games that are, um, you know, nostalgic and they have, you know, they give you the 80s, 90s feels, but um, they're, you know, they're new. Um, they're going to be doing new stuff and look all pretty and all that shiny stuff. Uh, uh, what are you developing? Run, die, run again? In? Yeah, and run, die, run again is an interesting um, out liar sort of because <laughs> it's not it's it it is old school and this I, i'm developing a unity sorry before i, yeah, no, before I go on a tangent but um um it's it is old school in the sense that um it it plays and feels uh even though it's first person it plays and feels like a platformer it feels like the platformer i i was not good enough just to be honest i wasn't good enough to make mario i remember seeing super mario and going my god what is this and i went home and tried to replicate what i what i remember feeling and i couldn't which is which was actually good because i always feel like um constraints breed creativity sure. so 
So because of that, um, I made a bunch of games that were platformers that didn't have a jump button because I couldn't get Mario's jump. But so this, you know, Run, Die, Run Again is a, is a first person platformer, but it feels like what you would think a first person Mario or first person Super Meat Boy feels like. Like the, the character is not super flighty. It, it, it's got weight to it, but it's controllable. And, you know, I give you coyote time so that, you know, you know, you don't have to be constantly watching your feet and whatnot. But it's but it's new because it's all it you know it, it's all shiny and got all the latest bells and whistles and it's um and it's first person which you know the the only first person platformer before Mirror's Edge was like what uh, jumping Jack Flash on the PlayStation. Uh, I can't remember if Metroid Prime was before Edge or not. Mirror's Edge. Yeah. Uh. Yeah. 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 That's right. Uh. Metroid Prime. That's so. Yeah. So it goes like Jumping Flash. Um. Oh. Metroid. And yeah. Then, oh. um, the, the other one from the 3D guy. Uh. Alpha Ville or whatever it is. I think it's called. It's, uh, it's, I mean, it's, it's that was a, I think that was an 80 synth rock band. But no. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I'm sorry to cut it off, but we have no. uh, we have gone through all of our time. But uh, I I wish you luck with Run Die Run again. I'm glad to see you uh, strike it out on your own because I I adore the Strike series. It was a oh, very big you. part of my childhood. So and and uh, unoff- real quick, unofficially uh, announced on a unannounced. I don't know, whatever. Um, yeah, a lot of people tell me they love the Strike series, and I do too. And I've always kind of been like, yeah, I don't want to go back to that. Um, but I am doing another game um, because I like keeping myself busy, and it's called uh, Chaos Chassis, and it is a top-down co-op shooter um, from the maker of you know the Strike series. Ooh. So it has a lot of that DNA. It's a bit you know it's more arcadey than a Strike game, okay. and it's inherently because it's top-down and it's co-op split screen. Um, so it is more about you and your buddy. Uh, going out and and wreaking havoc on the bad guys, but it still has that that strike DNA where it's not a a forced scroll shooter. It's go ever go wherever you want, and there's some resource management. You just have like big drunken missiles and whatnot too, because I love you know I grew up on Macross and and all of that <laughs> stuff. So, well, that's wonderful. And now I'm really getting hyped. Thank you, Tony. I'm <laughs> gonna get back to work, man. <laughs> Thanks, man. Thanks for the time, man. Thank you. I can't wait. All right. We're back. All right. So thank you, Tony Barnes. Hope to anxiously awaiting the release of Run, Die, Run Again. Uh, it's going to be, uh, it looks fantastic. And it does, like he said, it looks like it has that um, great retro, retro play feel with the shiny, the shiny new skins of today. But now that we've talked about the games that are going to be coming out, what have you all been playing? I recently pre-ordered the Monster Hunter Stories 2, which is a RPG adaption for the Monster Hunter series. And I used to play the, the first one, and it's good, but it's not at its best, and there are a lot of space for improving. I played the trial version for, the, for the, the second one. I'm sold. I literally just go right to the store and pre-order it. That's how, how good I feel like it is. So they so they made it that much better, huh? Yeah. Okay. Well, see, that's a that's the thing that they kind of I felt like they kind of tried to do a little bit with Monster Hunter World was they tried to make it like an RPG with the cutscenes and everything, but there's no connection to any characters. <laughs> it was just like, look, we're in this giant land air sea ship. You know, we, this kind of cutscene they never exist in a Monster Hunter game before Monster Hunter World. Like, they, there, there's never a big scenario or never a big story in Monster Hunter, but it's more about the story. It's all behind the description of the quest, which probably only, what... like, 40% of players will, will ever read about it. Exactly. It's just, like, all the descriptions of all the items in any massive RPG game. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Breath of the Wild's a fun game. Uh, <laughs> that's weird. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Like, go figure. Um, it's this. Um, it's this new Nintendo game. I don't know if you guys have heard about it, but it recently came out on the Nintendo Switch, which is also a pretty cool console. If you guys don't have it, I recommend picking it up. Um, I've been 
thoroughly enjoy. I'd had I didn't realize how much I would enjoy the Switch, and now that I have it, I'm kind of kicking myself for not buying it sooner. But also now I have a Switch to trade up to the Pro whenever it's coming out. I need no, I need a Pro controller. My hands my hands are too big for the tiny buttons. Yeah, that's it's my pretty only bad. Complaint. That's my only complaint. And or my friend had one of those slide on like handles for the whole switch to make it oh, like a mad cats thing yeah but not mad cats oh that's <laughs> I think a shame his was nerf <laughs> nice <laughs> yes you gotta have the the squishy grips honestly nerf needs to make new controllers rage proof nerf controllers that's a huge market if they can make them super <laughs> responsive and actually work if you can have a controller that's throwable, oh, that's God. a huge market. That's a huge market for the ragey gamer. It seems like a bad idea. Well, it, well, it's a bad business idea because if you do a good enough job, they're never going to break and they're never going to buy another controller. So I have a funny story about um, controllers. I, When they first came out, I picked up a uh, Steam controller. Oh, what are they called? I don't know. I think I it's just called like Steam the, Controller. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I don't know if you've ever seen that thing, but it is wild. It's uh, funky. Instead of joysticks, it has track pads, like circular track pads where your thumbs go. Hmm. And it has paddles on the back. It has uh, pressure-sensitive triggers and uh, bumpers. Uh, the buttons are a little small, uh, or at least the face buttons, A, B, X, Y. Um, and it's got gyro feedback. And it had all these features like way before any other controller was experimenting with this kind of thing. And it was a dismal failure. Like, nobody liked it. But mm. I really like it. And I still mm. use it when I'm playing computer games. Um, mm. Like, if, I, if I'm if i playing a game that needs a controller, I'll use it for my for my computer. Um, mm. Only recently have I started using my uh, uh, Switch controller for my, for my PC. Your, but Your Pro controller? Yeah, my Pro controller. Okay, okay. Because uh, that, like, that no, thing just feels controller. amazing. Like, it's a really comfortable controller for me. Uh, the one downside to the Steam controller is it is it feels extremely flimsy, like mm-hmm. it is really thin. Um, and I I've I play a lot of rage inducing games. I played Sekiro. I played uh, uh, Dark Souls, Hollow Knight, uh, games that make you want to throw things. Um, yes. And you know one of the things I do to deal with stress is to torque a controller, <laughs> like twist it like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, you can't see because you're listening, but you know I twisted my hands. You can't do that with a Steam controller because you will just break it in half. Like <laughs> it is, okay. it is that. Thin. Make sure you make sure you're just live on stream when it happens. Make right, sure you're right. streaming and make I'll sure hold it up to the like, camera and then yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> you got a spare one, do you? No, it's not that bad, but <laughs> but yeah, it's just in terms go to, of go to a rage room, Miles. Let that rage out, dude. <sighs> Go break a wall. Right. Throw some glass. Release that, man. It's good. Don't keep it pent up. <laughs> I know there are places like that in Japan. Like where you they, can just, I think they have you can just pay of... to smash things. Yes, there I... it is. Are there are there places like that in, in the Bay Area? You just make I an, don't know about the Bay Area. You just make an about... appointment and you go in and anything in the room is smashable. That sounds really good, actually. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just thinking about it. I'm relaxed. Mm-hmm. It's like, oh, all the destruction. <laughs> well, but anyway, I think we're just about running out of time for today's conversation. Once again, we want to thank Tony Barnes uh, of Retro Ninja Games for coming on and talking to us, or talking to Alex. But we hope to see the finished product of Run, Die, Run again very soon. Mm-hmm. And... As a piece of advice that he gave, uh, the biggest interesting thing that I thought he said was some of these people in the new developments are like essentially recoding older games, but they don't understand the decisions behind the old code and the limitations involved. So they're repeating some old mistakes. Uh, so learn your history, everybody. Keep listening to the Maidcast, and we'll help you make better games. <laughs> we will personally teach you. We will personally come over and hold your hand and be character models for you. Never take advice. I from didn't us, say by the that. Way. I didn't say that. Um, <laughs> I did not commit myself to being a character model. But you know, any other audio you guys need, we're your guys. So, 
We want to thank you very much for listening to the Museum of Art and Digital Entertainment's official podcast. If you have any thoughts, questions, corrections, or general museum ideas, please shoot us an email at info at the maid dot org. We would like to send out a big thank you to everyone who donated recently, and to our patron supporters who keep the maid afloat. Patron donors get to listen to this podcast one week before its release on major streaming services, and we will continue that with future episodes every week. Till then, I'm Chen. I'm Miles. I'm Red, and I'm Anthony. Thanks, and we'll see you next time.